thank you all so much for joining us for, for the Forgotten Nations, Native Tribes of New England. Colonization happened early on in the New England area, as early as 1609, so many Native nations and tribal histories were lost. Learn about the nations that called this land home, where they are now, and the thriving communities keeping their histories alive. And this presentation is, by, is led by Heather uh, Bruegel, an independent Indigenous consultant and historian. Uh, Heather is a citizen of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin and a first line descendant of uh, Stockbridge Muncie. Uh, she is the former director of education at Forge Project, and she travels frequently to present on Native American history, including policy and activism. So all 215 of us, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Heather for joining us here tonight. And Heather, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Wow. When people we're coming in from the waiting room and I'm just seeing the numbers grow. I was like, oh my gosh, so many people here to, to hear this talk and I'm super stoked that I'm able to, to bring it to you. Um, I, we were speaking earlier and I know it's been dreary and rainy where you are. It has been drainy, dreary and rainy where I am in Hudson, New York. So um, perfect night to grab a cup of tea or hot chocolate or whatever you have and hear about some native tribes um, of New England that we may not always hear about. Um, and just for reference, I kept this strictly to what has been historically defined as New England, which would be the colonies that were founded by the English. So I did not include any New York tribes because New York was primarily colonized by the Dutch at first. However, if you do have questions about those, um, I, I will be able to answer them at the end. And I did not include every nation because if I did, we would be here for way longer than an hour. So I've included several um, and then some big events that have happened in the New England area. And then we'll do some Q&A. So um, please utilize that chat feature for that. And please note, we'll do all questions at the end. So we'll get through the presentation first and then do questions at the end. Um, so I'm very excited to talk to you about the Forgotten Nations, Native Tribes of New England. Um, I think that's really important to talk about and, and make sure that we understand that. So first, I would like to begin yeah, with a land acknowledgement. Sorry, my mouse wasn't wanting to work there. This land acknowledgement is written for where I am in, in Hudson, New York. So we acknowledge that we are all coming from different nations that were the ancestral homes of indigenous nations. In upstate New York, we acknowledge the Mahikaniyak, the people of the waters that are never still. We acknowledge that through forced land sessions and removal, this nation was removed from the land that they call home and their seat of government is now located in Wisconsin. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors past and present. And we understand that this acknowledgement is just a first step in the process of building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. It's important to note that no matter where you are coming from uh, in the United States and or abroad, um, I know we had somebody, you know, coming in from, from New Zealand and other places, um, you're you're on the land of indigenous people. And it's important to make that acknowledgement, but also when you do that acknowledgement, you wanna make sure you have some action behind it. So the action that we are doing for this land acknowledgement, is I'm here uh, talking to you about some native nations and, and their rich history. Um, and I think that that's really important to, to note. So again, this acknowledgement is written for where I'm coming from in Hudson, New York, and I encourage you to visit nativeland.ca to find out what land you're currently on. So that would be really exciting to, to find out on your end. So again, uh, Robert already introduced me, but just a little bit more about myself. My name is Heather. I am an enrolled citizen of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin and a first line descendant, Stockbridge Muncie uh, Mohican. I, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I work as a historian and independent consultant with different organizations, working on decolonial efforts in those, in those organizations, creating more inclusive spaces. Um, one of my favorite things to do is what I am doing right now, and that is talking and teaching about Native history. It's absolutely my most favorite thing to do. 
If you want to get a hold of me, do please take down this email address that you see on the screen. Send me an email. Um, also, if you want me to come speak at your organization, you can use that email as well. A lot of my decolonial work you can find on Twitter um, at Heather Bragel, uh, Instagram at Heather M. Bragel, where you can see more of the work that I do and also see really cute photos of my two dogs who are currently being very quiet right now. So I will warn you about that. I do have, I'm in a little room and I have the door shut, but in case you hear them, uh -huh. The, they're my two little dogs and you can find them on Instagram as well. Also to learn more about the work that I do and to support the work that I do, you can visit heatherbriggle.com to learn a little bit more about uh, me. I do want to start out by saying I do not speak for any one tribal nation. I am a historian, so I talk about all broadly across the, the, the board. So I don't represent anyone. I am just a historian bringing you some facts and talking about some history. Um, so long before colonists arrived, Native nations in what is now called New England area were the first to call this area home. It's estimated that between 70,000 and 100,000 indigenous people lived in this area at the start of the 17th century. So in terms of centuries, centuries are always one number of head. So the 17th century would have been the 1600s. So it's important to note that at the start of that time, there were upwards of 100,000 indigenous people just in that area, just in that area. The first group of people I wanna talk about right now are the Wabanaki Confederacy. They are known as the people of the Dawnland, and that is pretty um, on point when you look at the map that's on your screen of the various locations. The Wabanaki Confederacy would be the area in the yellow. Um, so people of the Dawnland, they were the first to see the light because the sun rises in the east. And fun fact, when we are in ceremony, when we are praying, we pray facing the east because that is where the sun rises. It's the beginning. It's the dawn of a new day. So they were known as people of the Dawnland. The Confederacy formed around 1860, and this was in response to raids from the Haudenosaunee in Quebec and Ontario. The Haudenosaunee, people of the Longhouse, were also known as the Iroquois Confederacy, Six Nations, what have you, so different names. I tend to refer to them as Haudenosaunee, um, and I am a citizen of one of those Haudenosaunee tribes, the Oneida Nation. The Confederacy, uh, excuse me, the Confederacy consists of five tribal nations, and I did practice the pronunciation of some of these, um, but chances are I will get them wrong. So if we have anyone in the audience who is uh, part of one of these tribal nations, I apologize if I am mispronouncing the names wrong. But the first we have the Mi'kmaq, the Maliseet, the Passamaquoddy, the Abenaki, and the Pemscot. The Confederacy stretched from Newfoundland, 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 Newfoundland in the north to mid-south of Maine. So it comes into what is now considered part of the continental United States. So you look at the map and you'll see, uh, we're focusing on just the part in the yellow, um, how it stretches into what is now Canada. And then they come down into what is the main area um, uh, the, and what would have been uh, part of the 13 colonies. Like other indigenous nations, the Confederacy crosses what are now international borders. It's important to note that there are many tribal nations that not only have uh, bands um, or clans in uh, other parts of the North American continent, but there are also many tribal nations whose borders cross with what are now international borders. So you have that um, here in New York, you have uh, the Mohawk. There are Mohawk um, in, in what is the United States and in Canada, and their reservation kind of crosses that border. You've got that out west with some of the tribal nations that also butt right up to Canada. And then in the south, in the southern portion of the United States, you do have, um, I believe, one or two tribal nations that do cross the Mexican border. In fact, I will um, let you know, if you go back to this whole idea of building a wall, um, there is a tribal nation who flat out said, 
this this is tribal land here and this wall is not coming through our our tribal land that they exercised their tribal sovereignty in, in that and so just because it crosses that what is now an international border doesn't make it any less of that tribal nation so the wabanaki confederacy is one of those uh groups of indigenous people that have that border crossing now now obviously back in this time, there were not those international borders as we know now. Borders are colonial constructs. And so it's important to note that while now they cross international borders, at the time they did not. While the Confederacy formally disbanded in 1862, the nations that comprised it do remain close today, kind of like the Haudenosaunee. The Haudenosaunee formally disbanded um, prior to the start of the American Revolution. And that was because there was differences on who was gonna fight on what side. You had some tribes that wanted to remain neutral, some that fought on the side of the British, and some that fought on the side of the United States, the colonists. And so because of that disagreement, they disbanded as well, but still remain close to this day. And you can actually see the purple um, on this map is the outline of the Haudenosaunee uh, Confederacy, which um, is, let's see here, they have the five nations on here, but there are six nations. The Tuscarora did uh, come up from what is now North Carolina um, and join the, um, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy later on. So the next group of people I would love to talk to you about are the Wampanoag. The Wampanoag are the people of the first light. So similar to the people of the Dawnland, but these are the people of the first light. There are two federally recognized Wampanoag tribes in Massachusetts. You have the Mashpee and the Equina or Gayhead. They inhabited the lands of Massachusetts and Eastern Rhode Island. The language group that they are part of is the Algonquin language group. And that actually is quite common for this area of the United States. The language group that is in this area of the United States is primarily Algonquin, Algonquin speaking tribes. From 1615 to 1619, the nation suffered a long epidemic of smallpox and other diseases. As it did with many native nations, disease ripped through the Wampanoag Nation and it sometimes wiped out complete villages a uh, population was decimated very, very fast. This was something that happened throughout all tribal nations, but the Wampanoag did experience this as well. Early contact with the Wampanoag dates back to the early 16th century when merchant vessels would travel along the coast, right? So the Wampanoag's land is primarily in the eastern part of Massachusetts and Rhode Island area. And so they could obviously be close to the coast and they would see these merchant ships. And so that's kind of where contact first started. Captain Thomas Hunt, an English captain, would capture Wampanoags and sold them to Spain as slaves. One of those that was sold into slavery was a man by the name of Squanto. When he was finally able to travel back to his homeland in 1619, he found that his entire village had been wiped out due to what was believed to be a smallpox epidemic. Another interesting fact about the Wampanoags is they were the ones that greeted the pilgrims. So I wanna to talk to you a little bit about Plymouth Rock and that first encounter. On December 21st, 1620, the pilgrims who were on the Mayflower landed in Plymouth Harbor, what is now called Plymouth Harbor. I actually just, my husband and I just did a um, a road trip across the United States in August because who doesn't like to be in a car for 20 days? And that's exactly how long we were gone. But we do, we started, we wanted to do coast to coast. So we drove the three and a half so hours to Plymouth. And then we drove all the way across to Seaside, Oregon. And when I say we drove, he really drove. I was a very bad navigator. But he drove the whole way. But um, so we when we were we we picked Plymouth as our starting point because as a history nerd, I got to nerd out a little bit. And I said, I want to go see Plymouth Rock. And so we went and saw Plymouth Rock and I saw Plymouth Rock and I was not impressed. I was like, it's a rock. OK, great. Um, so if you live in Plymouth and you enjoy going to Plymouth Rock, I apologize. But I, I was not impressed at all. But 
the history person in me was like, I am now at Plymouth Rock. So we kind of started our journey where the pilgrims came in and we actually ended our journey in Seaside, Oregon, where Lewis and Clark ended their expedition. So this whole trip was very history minded. So um, anyway, I digress. The pilgrims stand, uh, settled on an abandoned settlement that was a home to a Wampanoag tribe um, and that was part of the Confederacy who had been devastated by a series of plagues and were virtually wiped out. The first formal contact with indigenous peoples in the area came on March 16th, 1621, when Samoset and Abenaki walked into their settlement and proclaimed, welcome Englishmen. The Abenaki, as we talked about a little bit ago, are an Algonquin speaking tribe that called New England and areas of Quebec home. They are one of the tribes of the Wabanaki Confederacy. During this visit, they learned that the leaders in the area were those of Wampanoag tribes and that Massasoit was one of their chiefs or sachems or leaders. They also learned of Squanto, who was virtually a, the sole survivor of the plagues that hit his community. Samoset stayed the night in the settlement and agreed to arrange a meeting between the pilgrims and Massasoit. Massasoit and Squanto were cautious of the pilgrims. They didn't quite trust them. Who are these people that are coming in? We've never seen you before. You came in on this pencil we don't know of. You speak a language we don't understand. You dress funny. Um, and so we're not, we're, they were just a little suspicious of them. Massasoit's first encounter with the English, several of his uh, men had been killed by English sailors. So previous, that was Massasoit's first encounter. So he was leery. And in the case of Squanto, he had been kidnapped um, by the Spanish and spent five years in England, but he did learn English. But he was also a little leery. On March 22nd, Samasot returned to the settlement with a delegation of 60 warriors from Massasoit that included Squanto. Massasoit himself would join the delegation later on. He and the pilgrims negotiated a peace agreement and Squanto acted as a translator. Gifts were exchanged with the pilgrims, giving Massasoit a pair of knives, a copper chain, biscuits, and quote, a pot of strong water. I think we all know that that was not water. In the peace agreement, both sides promised not to hurt each other, but instead to help each other if either were ever hit by a third party attack. In other words, if they come and get you, we're going to help you out and vice versa. After the peace agreement was made, at the urging of Massasoit, Squanto acted as a diplomat, translator, and educator. He taught them how to farm in the area, fish, and gather supplies. In October of 1621, Massasoit invited the pilgrims to join in the Wampanoag harvest ceremony. This helps lead to the myth of why, quote, Thanksgiving is celebrated today. It helps lead to the myth, right? Because there's more to that story. But this is where in popular culture, you see that story start to come up. And as a reminder, we're heading into Native American Heritage Month, which is always in November and Thanksgiving also falls in November. So I do encourage you to do some reading on your own and to find out more about what really went on in that first uh, Thanksgiving ceremony. Still keeping with the Wampanoag though, we're gonna talk a bit about um, this war that happened between the Wampanoags and the colonists. So Massasoit, like others, had adopted many colonial ways, including having his children giving English names. Towards the end of his life, he asked legislature, legislators in Plymouth to give his sons English names. Wamasuda became Alexander and Metacom was named Philip. When Massasoit died, Alexander became sachem, leader or chief. However, he became seriously ill after coming back from the, a visit in Plymouth and he died. So after his death, Philip, his brother became sachem. When Philip assumed leadership, the relationship between the Wampanoags and the colonists changed. Fearing that the colonists would just continue to take more land, but also take culture, religion, and their way of life, Philip decided that he was going to limit further expansion. 
uh, there was an understanding between Philip's father, Massasoit, and the colonists um, of who was going to settle where and whatnot. But Philip decided he was, nope, you're not getting any more land. The Wampanoags only numbered around a thousand at this time, so Philip began reaching out to other neighboring tribes to build an alliance. In 1671, Philip was called to Taunton, Massachusetts, if I said that right, where he was forced to listen to accusations by colonists and made to sign an agreement that would have the Wampanoag give up their firearms. Philip left right after, and his men never delivered their weapons. Uh, Philip was able to gain support from the Nipmuc and the Narragansett, and they planned the beginning of an uprising for the spring of 1676. However, though, in March of 1675, a Christian Indian by the name of John Sassamon was murdered. He was educated at Harvard, and he worked as a counselor for Philip. And a week before his death, he reported to the colonists and the governor, Josiah Winslow, that Philip was planning a war, a rebellion. When John's body was found, three Rampanag warriors were taken into custody and they were accused of his murder. They were tried by a jury of 12 colonists and six Christian Indians, and he was hung in June of 1675. This act was the catalyst combined with rumors that the colonists wanted to capture Philip that led to war. Philip called a council of war on Mount Hope, and war was ultimately on the horizon. This leads to what is King Philip's War. So several isolated attacks were carried out in Swansea, Swansea um, settlements in the Plymouth Colony on June 20th, 1675. During that summer of 1675, Native warriors carried out attacks in Middlesbrough, Dartmouth, uh, Mendon, Brookfield, Lancaster, and in the fall, they hit Deerfield, Hadley, and Northfield. When war broke out, Philip was able to gain alliances with other Native nations, including the Nipmuc. The Narragansetts joined the alliance after the colonists attacked one of their fortresses. They uh, lost a number of people in what would become the Great Swamp Massacre, and we're going to actually talk about that in just a little bit. In, six, in the spring of 1676, the war turned against Philip after that winter was super harsh and plagued with hunger and deprivation. The colonists sent people after him and um, a Narragansett, Narragansett leader um, was actually taken captive and he was executed. His body was quartered and his head was sent to Hartford, Connecticut to be on display as a warning. Philip, though, was able to escape to Mount Hope, Rhode Island. In August, colonial forces attacked and killed and captured 173 Wampanoag. Philip's wife and son were captured in this raid and then sold as slaves to the West Indies. On August 12, 1676, Philip's camp was surrounded and he was then shot and killed. We move on now to the Pequot. The Pequots, are an Algonquin group of people who have inhabited southeastern Connecticut for more than 10,000 years. The reason I like to put that in there is because it shows that we have been here from the beginning. These are our homes, this is our land. There is a debate though, as to whether the Pequot migrated from the Hudson River Valley to central and eastern Connecticut. So some say that they originated in Hudson River Valley area where I am and then moved to Connecticut. So there is some debate about that. At one point, the Pequot and the Mohegan, not Mohican, but Mohegan, were a single group. But the Mohegans broke off from the main group in the 17th century as the Pequot started to exercise more control of Connecticut. In the 18th century, small groups of Pequot joined other nations in the area, including the Brotherton and the Oneidas. Something significant happened in Pequot history, and I think it's important to talk about. And this was the Pequot Wars. The Pequot War was an armed conflict that ended up taking place between the colonists in New England that were settled at Plymouth, Massachusetts, uh, or Plymouth, Massachusetts Bay, 
Saybrook and their allies, the Narragansett and Mohegan nations um, on one side and the Pequots on the other side. Now, remember, I just told you that the Pequots and the Mohegans were together at one point. They were, they were best friends. They were BFFs. They've split now. And now war is going to break out and the Mohegans are on the opposite side fighting with the colonists. So keep that in mind. There are the theories of events that would eventually lead to war in 1637. Beginning in the early 1630s, conflicts were arising. The Pequots and Mohegans aligned themselves differently. The Pequot with the Dutch and the Mohegan with the English. However, peace between the Pequot and the Dutch didn't last very long either. The Massachusetts Bay Colony became a stronghold for wampum production, which the Pequot and the Narragansett had controlled until the mid-1630s. Wampum, if you're not sure, is a shell. Um, it's found in the eastern part of the United States, primarily the New England area. Seven English privateers were murdered um, by, a, by the Niatics, a tributary client of the Pequot, and this was in response to the Dutch murdering a principal Pequot chief. They ended up saying they didn't know that the crew, uh, the crewmen were English. They thought they were Dutch. There was also a demand for land in Pequot controlled areas, such as Massachusetts and Connecticut. The areas in question were important because they controlled access to the Connecticut River and that rich valley. In 1634, there was a group of unknown natives who killed slave hunter John Stone of Massachusetts uh, and eight of his hunting companions. The Puritans then used his death to claim jurisdiction over the Pequot and all of their lands. The Pequots then attacked settlers in Connecticut on Pequot land. And the governor of Massachusetts then organized a military to push, um, to push the Pequots out. On May 26, 1637, under the lead of Captain John Mason, 90 men, along with 200 Mohegans and Narragansetts, decided to launch a surprise attack and then set fire to a Pequot settlement at Mystic River. Over 700 men, women, and children were killed. Losing men constantly eventually broke the spirit of the Pequot. They eventually decided to flee their lands and seek refuge in the West with the Mohawks. In mid-June, John Mason ended up catching up to those Pequot who were escaping and surrounded them in uh, present-day Fairfield, Connecticut. He eventually would allow a couple hundred to surrender. This was mostly women and children. The Pequot leader at the time and around eight warriors were able to sneak out, at, but when they made it to New York, instead of finding refuge with the Mohawks, they were killed instantly. This was essentially the end of the Pequot War. Those who survived the war were sent to live with the Mohegans or the Narragansetts. Others were put on ships and sent to Bermuda as slaves. Many were made to work as servants in English homes in the colony. The colonies declared that the Pequot were now extinct and prohibited them from ever using their name. We know today the Pequots are not extinct, but in the minds of the English colonists, they declared them extinct. So the Pequot Wars were quite harsh. Now we're going to briefly talk about the Narragansett. The Narragansett have always um, have traditionally called Rhode Island home. Archaeological evidence shows that the nation established their home in the area more than 30,000 years ago. It was first written, the first written evidence of contact between the nation and colonists or explorers occurred in 1524 when Giovanni de Verencio visited Narragansett Bay and wrote about the large indigenous population that he encountered. More often than not, the tribe would offer protection to smaller tribes in the area. In return, many would, would pay tribute to the Narragansett. In 1636, Roger Williams was able to acquire land rights to Providence from the Narragansett leadership. This would end up resulting in an influx of colonists coming in and settling. The nation would also um, ally, um, align itself with Wampanoag in King Philip's War, but they paid a big price. What got them to eventually align themselves in that war was something called the Great Swamp Massacre. Until then, they remained neutral, right? They weren't going to fight in King Philip's War, but then this happened and they decided that they were going to join. 
So on what was described as a cold and snowy day in December of 1675, uh, more than a thousand colonists, along with 150 Pequot and Mohegan warriors, attacked a Narragansett stronghold in what is now South Kingstown, or Kingston, however you pronounce it. Until this event, the Narragansett remained neutral. They didn't join either side. The colonists, though, believed that the Narragansett were hiding Wampanoag warriors who fought alongside King Philip. The Narragansett had built a settlement deep in a swamp for safety and protection, kind of hidden, out of sight, like there's this war going on around us, we have to protect our people, let's, let's dig in a little bit, and that's what they did. But an Indian guide who was working for the United Colonies of New England led a colonial army to that area. Once they arrived, the soldiers found a number of wigwams, longhouses, and around 3,000 Narragansett women and children. However, the soldiers uh, didn't see the women and children as innocent bystanders. They looked at everyone who was in that settlement, men, women, children, elders, as participants in a war. The soldiers then proceeded to set fires, set the homes on fire, burning the settlement to the ground. As many Narragansett people tried to escape, they were met with soldiers waiting on the other side of a fence that they had built to protect the settlement. And once they got to that other side of that fence and they were face to face with those soldiers, they were shot on sight. The numbers vary, but anywhere between 200 and 500 Narragansett died. Still more died from cold and lack of food as they tried to escape the area. That single act led the Narragansett to join King Philip's War and fight on the side of the Wampanoags. So it's very important to, to note that they remained neutral for a very, very long time. But once this massacre happened, they joined the war and they fought on the side of the Wampanoags. Because what King, it all goes back to King Philip's War. What King Philip's War was about was stopping that push, that push inward of colonists, settlers, invaders, whatever term you want to use, from coming in and taking more land. So much had already been taken from the Wampanoags and other tribal nations in that area that they were like, we need to put a stop to this. Philip Medicom was like, we need to put a stop to this. Yes, my father ruled in this way, but this is how I'm going to do it. And saw it in his best interest to doing that. And remember, this is extremely early on. King Philip's War, the Great uh, Swamp Massacre, the Pequot Wars, all happened in the 1600s, right? Colonization on this side of the continent happened in the 1600s. My Mohican ancestors met Henry Hudson in 1609, right? So that is an extremely, extremely early in the formation of what would later become the United States. And while many of these wars were meant to put an end to the Native nations in the area, to kind of put a cap on it and say, this is ours, we, we've solved the quote Indian problem, it didn't. And it didn't because we do have a number of federally recognized tribal nations that are still here today. These are all nations that um, are recognized by the federal government that have their homelands in different parts of New England area that um, are part of the Wabanaki Confederacy or the Pequot or the Mohegan or the Wampanoag, um, the Narragansett. These are a number of tribes. We, there are also a number of state recognized tribes, which are different than federally recognized tribes, but still recognized. And then there are some that are not, that does not make them any less indigenous and it does not make them any less, um, you know, a tribal nation. They're still a tribal nation. It's just, there's varying degrees of that. So it's important to note that while these nations don't, aren't maybe in the mainstream in the New England area, that it's important to recognize that they were here 
are still here and continuing to carry on vibrant traditions. I have to say, um, I am from the Midwest. I uh, live, uh, grew up in Michigan. And um, where I grew up in Southeast Michigan, and then I, li I did live briefly in Wisconsin, we do have tribal nations. Um, Michigan has 12 federally recognized tribes and Wisconsin has 11, right? So I've been around tribal people, uh, reservations and native nations for a very, very long time. And there's evidence of that, right? It's recognized. I have to say when I moved to this part of the country, the Eastern part of the country, where my ancestors originated from, where many others ancestors originated from, it's, it's striking to see the difference um, in seeing indigenous people all the time to really not seeing them all the time. And this is where we started. But the reason we don't have that strong hold on indigenous people here, I think is also because this is where colonization started. This is where settlements started to come in. This is where our shores started to be invaded. And so it happened so early on that it was wiped out very early on. But we have these tribal nations on the screen right here that have rich, vibrant cultures, museums, archives in this area that you can go to and learn more about. That's really important. And I think it's really uh, a good thing that we recognize those nations today. Finally, I just wanted to leave you with some suggested readings and documentaries that you may want to check out that cover not just the tribes here in New England, but Indigenous history all across Indian country. So we will start with some books. Well, actually, no, I'm going to tell you, go to the Library of Congress website. Library of Congress website is amazing. And I didn't put it up here, but you should also go to the National Archives website as well. Um, Library of Congress, I really like to use for maps and and other um, like land claims and documents. Those are really interesting. National Archives has digitized over 300 um, treaties between the United States and Indigenous nations, and you can read them. They're fascinating. It's amazing what you can find. But going to the books, An Indigenous People's History of the United States um, by Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz is just that. It's an Indigenous People's History of the United States. Native American History by Judith Nyes is a book that kind of runs in a timeline fashion. So it has on one side of the page what's happening, like the years and everything, and what's happening in Indigenous history at the same time as what's happening in um, non-Indigenous history. So, uh, and around the world, not just in the United States, but other places as well. And it's really cool to see the timeline of things happening um, as it's going on. We have Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee by Dee Brown, which has probably been one of the best-selling books on Indigenous history since the 1970s. It's obviously, it is the most reproduced. Um, and it's, I encourage you to read that. And I encourage you to follow it up with The Heartbeat of Wounded Knee by David Troyer. Um, Dee Brown's book ends in 1890 with the Wounded Knee Massacre. And it kind of just ends. It's like end of the Indian Wars, end of everything, right? Where David Troyer's book, The Heartbeat of Wounded Neat, says, yes, while some things did end in 1890, we did not. We are, we are continuing on. And it's just beautiful. I love it. You need to get it. We Shall Remain is a documentary that you can stream on PBS. Um, if you're able to, if you have the PBS app, um, you can also stream it on, I, I have watched it on Amazon as well. But it is like a five-part documentary series that goes through the history of Indigenous people. And the first two episodes are about the tribes in New England. So I would very much encourage you to watch that. A Hundred Years is a documentary um, about Eloise Cobell, who was a uh, Blackfoot. Um, and this goes through a recent court case because it was finally settled when um, President Obama was was president, but Eloise was a treasurer for the Blackfeet tribe in Montana, and she discovered some mismanagement of funds on the federal government side and was able to get this huge settlement. Um, so I recommend you watch that. You can also stream that on your streaming services. And then finally, a documentary that I really love to, to recommend because it is um, by one of my most favorite Indigenous authors, poets, visionaries, John Trudell. Um, and the documentary is called Trudell. 
and it is about John and his work and it's his voice and it's really amazing. And so I am, I encourage you all to, to watch that as well. But I also uh, thank you very much for listening to what felt like a super brief history of New England tribes, but um, one that I thought was really important to discuss um, some of these nations, but also some of these big events that happened here uh, in the New England area. Um, again, if we had talked about all of them, we would have been here for hours, but I am open to answering any questions that you might have, and I appreciate you guys you know, taking some time out of your evening to, to maybe learn something. So I guess we'll just go to the, the Q&A now. So Heather, a wonderful job as expected. Uh, I can read some of the comments and questions to you. Uh, yeah, so as Heather said, folks, now's the time to ask your, your burning questions and uh, we'll take approximately 15 minutes here. Uh, so Teresa agrees with you that Plymouth Rock is very disappointing. Uh, Jean asks, can you visit the site of the Great Swamp Massacre in Rhode Island? Do you happen to know that? I believe you can. The photo that I had, let me see if I can scroll back. This photo is like a monument mm -hmm. area there. So you should be able to go there and, um, and, to, and to see the site. I haven't done it yet. Um, you know, I have some time coming up where I do plan to like drive around and visit all these different places. But um, yeah, I think you would be able to get there. Uh, Joyce says this presentation has been excellent. Thank you. Uh, Jay says, thank you for taking your time to do this. Uh, this is wonderful. Uh, a request from Christine. Uh, what is your website? I was just about to go back to that contact page. There we go. Great. <laughs> uh, Jan says, wonderful presentation. Um, and then let me preface, I'm gonna ask some questions here. If I unintention, I wanna apologize in advance if I mispronounce anything or if I say something the wrong way and I'm just gonna read the questions as, um, as uh, the folks wrote them. And uh, I don't think anything is meant if anything is um, worded the wrong way. I think we're all here uh, for the right reasons. Uh, so Sherry asks, uh, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. In school, the indigenous people were never mentioned by name. And I recently learned about the Lenape people. What happened to them and did anyone survive? The Lenape people are still around. Um, <laughs> the Lenape people are still here. So um, I, you know, on my Stockbridge Muncie side, Muncie is um, a group of Lenape people who, sm who spoke the Muncie language, who joined with the uh, Mohicans, Stockbridge Mohicans. And so um, there is, um, you have the Stockbridge Muncie who recognize, who are recognized as Lenape. You have the Delaware tribe and the Delaware nation, both in Oklahoma. And you've got a number of different bands in Canada. So um, the Lenape people are still here. Um, the area which encompasses New York City, so that would be the boroughs, and then um, upwards, you know, even to just before here is, is called Lenape Hoking, and that is land of the Lenape. Um, so the Lenape people are still around. And, you know, I am not sure surprised that you didn't learn about them in school or indigenous people in school. Um, it's, it's unfortunately, it's not required teaching, but um, I am glad that you uh, were curious about them. But yes, the Lenape are still strong. If you want to learn more about the Lenape, I encourage you to visit the website for the Lenape Center, um, who is doing great work in New York City to kind of get um, awareness of the Lenape people out there. Uh, James asks, where do the Mi'kmaq Indians originate from? They would be the uh, the northern parts of Maine and Quebec area. Mm -hmm. uh, several, <laughs> you know, we, we get this every time, Heather. Uh, uh, an anonymous attendee asks, would you be willing to share these slides so we can refer to them later? And Michelle asks, can you send us a copy of the presentation? I'd like to watch the videos you noted. So folks, I will send you the recording of this presentation. Uh, Heather, I don't know, and I don't mean to spot you, but I'm not sure what your policy is regarding uh, the sharing of your slides. 
Well, I believe the slides would appear in the recording. There you go. Good. We'll, we'll leave you it there. There you go. I think that's right. Uh, Lizzie yeah. asks, what is the current status of tribal access to natural resources like the Connecticut River and other traditional lifeways? Yeah, so this is a really good question. I appreciate this question. Um, it all determines what was written in the treaties that you uh, that tribal nations signed with the federal government. And some treaties um resource rights so resource and mineral mineral rights were put in there um in others they may not have been in there so it's all dependent i know there is one uh i know of one case that happened in the 1980s in wisconsin with the ojibwe practicing their traditional um spearfishing ways on uh some of the rivers and lakes up north in wisconsin and the 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 courts actually ruled no they have absolutely every right to do this because in said treaty you know it was expressly written that they have this so while they may not have had um access to said waterway in terms of it part of their reservation land they still maintained those uh, water and resource rights. So it's very dependent and it can vary from nation to nation. Um, Wyeth asks, what happened to the remnants of the Wapanag following King Philip's war? Did the, Mass did the um, Massachusetts play a role in the war? I did not read anything about the Massachusetts playing a role in King Philip's war. Mm -hmm. And the Wampanoag that uh, survived would have uh, fought really hard to stay in the area. I mean, we have two federally recognized Wampanoag tribes who are descendants of those who fought in King Philip's War. So they are still loud and proud. <laughs> uh, let's see here. So many good questions. My goodness. Um, <laughs> I tried I to talk fast so we could get oh, through. No. Uh, Adam asks, what can someone like me do today to recognize and acknowledge the land I live on does or should not belong to me? How can I be part of the solution? Oh, great question. Um, well, first of all, attending talks like this and then telling someone about them, telling someone something that you just learned is helping to be part of the solution. The other thing that you can do to be part of the solution is, um, I don't like the term ally. I don't like that term. I want you to be an accomplice. I want you to be down on the ground with us, fighting, excuse me, fighting for, um, helping us fight for our land rights, land back, uh, honoring of treaties, being down there with us, amplifying the voices of indigenous peoples, using whatever privilege you might have in whatever way that you can to push indigenous voices forward. That's not only how you honor the land, but that's how you honor and um, work with uh, indigenous nations. Uh, Mary asks, did each of these five tribes speak a distinct language? Could they understand each other? So they were, the tribe that we talked about today were part of the Algonquin language family, meaning they were similar right? They were similar, um, not the same, but similar. So yes, there would have been some sort of similar understanding. Some words might have meant the same thing. It's kind of like if you think about the Romance languages, Italian, Spanish, they're different languages, but they're from the same language family. So there are some similarities. So it would have been the same here too. Uh, Betsy asks, why are some tribes federally recognized and others are not? How does a tribe acquire federal recognition? What is the process? And why have some tribes apparently lost federal recognition? Right. So unfortunately, federal recognition is really at the whim of the federal government. So you can be a tribe that's been recognized for however long and I don't know if somebody at the Bureau has a bad day, not that this would happen, but if somebody at the Bureau has a bad day, they could just take it away. In order to become a federally recognized tribe, there is a 
plethora of bureaucratic paperwork that you have to go through. It is a process. There are some tribes who have been applying for 20 plus years to be federally recognized. And so it's a long process that um, you have to make sure that there are absolutely no flaws on your application. You have to make sure that your periods are in the right place and your I's are dotted and your T's are literally crossed. Um, the reason that there are some federally recognized tribes and not federally recognized tribes, I do believe is a matter of paperwork. Um, it's a lot and it costs a lot. Um, to be federally recognized. So sometimes a tribal nation just may not have the resources to be able to go through that long process and go through that fight and be able to do it. It does not mean that they are any less indigenous. It does not mean that they are not a tribal nation. I honor that um, and, and really feel that they are a tribal nation. Um, they're just not recognized by the federal government. Uh, Leslie says, incredibly interesting information and wonderful, a lot of information, which is prompting me to learn more. Uh, I have a particular interest and fondness for the, oh boy, M-I-K-M-A-Q history, uh, as well as those notable tribes of the Massachusetts coast. Uh, thank you again. How am I pronouncing that tribe, uh, Heather? Uh, Mickey. Mickey. Okay. Sorry about yeah. that. And uh, Marianne asks, any suggestions of ways to get to know our local tribes? Uh, uh, Nipmuc, uh, again, N-I-P-M-U-C, I apologize, is the land I am on. Uh, you mentioned museums. How do we find them? Well, we all carry computers <laughs> in our pockets. Um, you can Google, Google them. Uh, the Pequot have a very cool museum in Connecticut on the eastern, in the eastern part of Connecticut. Uh, the Narragansett, I believe, have one in Rhode Island. Um, the, you know, obviously, uh, tribal nations, the Wampanoag, I believe, uh, have one as well. But it's just a matter of, you know, just showing up to things, you know, a lot of tribes put on and celebrate, uh, tradition and culture with a powwow, those are open to the public, right? You do not have to be a tribal citizen um, or a member of a tribal nation in order to attend those. Go to them, learn, watch the dancing, um, eat the amazing food, uh, be in awe of the great um, indigenous artists and vendors that are there, you know, purchase those goods, uh, go online, read about, go to the tribal websites specifically and read about the history of, of those tribes. Go to their museums if they have, if they have them. It's, it's very easy to become involved and you don't have to feel like, if you're waiting for an invitation, stop waiting, just go and do. Um, but also be respectful when you're in those spaces. Um, and if you're learning, if you're trying to, if you're wanting to do work with an indigenous nation, come to the table already knowing part of that history. Don't put the education, you don't put your education on somebody else. Come to the table already knowing something, but just be involved. Just go do and be, and you will be, oh, you will be embraced. Uh, Noelle says, many thanks for your time in this presentation. Uh, I am an Oklahoma a Choctaw living in Boston and appreciate learning more about the land I inhabit. Uh, James says, thank you very much for this educational presentation. It was very good. Uh, Michelle says, thank you so much for continuing to make sure people remember us. Uh, Catherine says, uh, to give a shout out to some excellent museums, including the Abe Museum, A-B-B-E, -E, uh, in Bar, Bar Harbor, Maine, the Hudson Museum in Orono, O-R-O-N-O, uh, -O -O, Maine, and the Plymouth uh, Patuxet Museum in Plymouth, Mass. Hopefully I got most of that correct. Uh, let me jump back to the questions. Uh, oh, oh, whoa, look at the time. So folks, uh, we're gonna wrap up in the next five minutes or so. Uh, let uh, Heather know in the chat how much you enjoy tonight's presentation. And as we start to wind down, uh, let me just ask a couple more questions. An anonymous attendee asks, do Native American tribes live together in communities on their own or uh, are they part of non-Native communities? Well, um, I live in Hudson, New York, and I do not live on a res, so 
I am a city Indian, an urban Indian. Um, you don't have to live on a reservation, um, but you can. There are a number of reservations across the United States where um, they're just like any other communities that you would see. They're like your neighborhood, right? Um, they are different in some ways, but um, in terms of, you know, living, um, you can live wherever you want. You're not confined to a reservation. We haven't been confined to reservations since the early 1900s. Uh, Mary wants to know, who is your favorite Indigenous poet? Honestly, I really do like John Trudell. <laughs> He's probably one of my favorite. And uh, there, uh, thank you for a wonderful presentation, says an anonymous attendee. Are there any genealogical or family history websites that you would recommend for Native American ancestry? Um, I would actually contact um, the... If you're looking for, if you're looking into your own family history, I would contact the enrollment office for whatever tribal nation you believe you have that ancestry in. They would be able to give you the correct um, tools and information that you would be able to trace that with. All right, so I am going to make sure to save this chat, Heather, so you see the literally dozens and dozens of positive comments folks are leaving you. And Heather, oh, yes, I was actually going to ask if you could send yes. me the chat. <laughs> chat has been saved. Uh, so folks, um, let's give Heather one last big virtual round of applause. And Heather, do you have any last words for the audience before we wrap up? Oh my gosh, I'm just overwhelmed by the amount of people that signed on. I kept seeing that number rise and I was like, oh my goodness. Um, but just thank you guys so much. Um, I can see that there is there is a hunger for this history, and I'm just really glad that I'm able to stand on the shoulders of my ancestors and help bring this to you and remind you that we are still here, we are still thriving, and uh, we're not going anywhere. And so I just appreciate it, and thank you uh, for hosting. I, I really do appreciate that. Yeah, you are welcome, Heather. I want to thank uh, the 240 of you that uh, attended and uh, the dozens of you that asked questions and made comments. I want to thank the friends of the Tewksbury Library for sponsoring and want to thank the libraries in uh, Carlisle, Chumsford, Clinton, Danvers, Essex, Groveland, Medford, Medway, Melrose, North Andover, North Reading, Pepperell, Rockport, Saugus, Wakefield, and Westford for partnering with Tewksbury. Look for an email, to, for those watching live, look for an email from me tomorrow with the recording, the feed feedback survey and some information about some other upcoming virtual Native American history programs. So thank you again, Heather, and I hope everyone has a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.